All right, this is a continuation really of the chapter 11 discussion around weighted average cost of capital. And it's taking that concept and applying it to the entire firm and determining the firm's optimal capital structure. Capital structure is a combination of debt and equity used to finance a firm. And again, I'll, I'll also refer to it as the capital stack. Um, the target capital structure is the ideal mix of debt preferred stock and common equity with which a firm plans to finance its investments. So we saw with Unilate that it was 45% debt, 5% preferred stock and 50% equity. But how did they get there? And there's four factors that drive the capital structure decisions. The first one is the firm's business risk. The second one is a firm's tax position. The third is the financial flexibility of both the firm and the market. And then the fourth is a managerial attitude. There's some companies, for instance, where they go, we will not ever have outside shareholders or we will not ever uh, raise debt. And so those are uh, managerial attitudes that might impact um, the target capital structure. When we look at um, business risk and, the, and kind of the components of that, there, it's the risk associated with the firm's operation ignoring any financing effects. And factors that affect business risk include sales variability, um, input price variability. So, you know, is, is there, how much volatility do you see on the operational side with sales? And then do you have inputs like, let's say, uh, the precious metals or aluminum or oil where the input price might vary considerably from month to month or day to day even? Um, and the ability to adjust output prices with change in input prices. So what's your, uh, what's your price elasticity in the market? Can you, if your input prices go up, so if the price of labor or the price of a raw material goes up, can you increase your prices that you're charging to your customers or are your customers going to substitute in another good and go somewhere else? And again, you can start seeing how economics and finance relate and, and kind of correlate strongly. And then also the extent to which costs are fixed and, and that's your operating leverage. So all basically all businesses have a fixed cost and a variable cost component. And the more your costs are variable, then, you know, the essentially the lower the risk, but potentially um, the lower the profitability and the higher your uh, percentages of fixed costs. That's operating leverage, so you could produce a bunch more, and it's not going to cost you much more. But you've got to cover that initial uh, that initial fixed cost amount, and that's a risk as well. So it's operating leverage. Just talked about it some. It's the use of fixed operating costs. If co if most costs are fixed, they don't decline when demand falls or increase when demand rises. Then the firm has a high degree of operating leverage, and they and you'll see that is. DOL, degree of operating leverage or operating leverage. And we're going to dig into this because these next couple chapters are building on analyzing your business and your operating leverage, your financial leverage, and trying to optimize that out and understanding kind of what levers you can pull um, to optimize your, your business's uh, return. So financial leverage, um, financial risk is driven by um, that which is beyond the business risk. So it's based upon how your capital stack is structured. And it's the extent to which fixed in some income securities like debt and preferred stock are used in a firm's capital structure. Remember, debt and preferred stock don't participate in the company's profits. And so as a result, when you've got, um, so their amount that you're going to pay them is fixed. They've got a fixed return for their investment. The common stock gets to participate in the profits. So as profits go up, common stock makes more money. However, the debt and preferred stock need to be paid first. So the more debt and preferred stock you have, the more leverage you have, essentially. And we'll talk through that and you'll see how that works. Um, but leverage is a very powerful thing um, for good and for bad. So business risk depends on business factors like competition, product, market, inputs, business inputs, operating leverage. And financial risk depends on the types of securities issued. Debt, more debt equals more financial risk. The structure of your of your cap your capital stack or your capital structure will impact significantly your financial risk.
When you're looking to determine your optimal capital structure, you seek to maximize the price of the firm stock. Again, understanding that the there are a lot of other stakeholders and a lot of other inputs which could go into um, determining the the reasons for why a business does what it does. To simplify things for the purposes of this course, and generally when you see it um, in the real world as well, the initial uh, premise is that our job as managers is to maximize the firm's stock price. And so changes in the use of debt cause changes in the firm's required rate of return and thus in the stock price. You saw that when we looked at the last chapter in chapter 11, where Unilate, what, the more debt they added in order to keep that capital structure stable, they needed to then issue additional uh, common stock, which then started raising the required rate of return. And the cost of debt um, varies with capital structures and financial leverage increases financial risk which in turn uh, increases overall risk and the firm's required um, weighted average cost of capital. So if our objective is to maximize the firm's value, which means to minimize its weighted average cost of capital, then essentially what we're looking for is cash is, the firm's value is the sum of the expected future cash flows discounted at a required rate of return, which measures the overall risk of the firm. So again, same concept over and over and over again in finance, the value of anything, the value of a bond, the value of a stock, the value of preferred stock, the value of a project, the value of a firm is driven by the expected future cash flows discounted at a required rate of return. So how much cash am I going to get and what's the risk associated with it? The higher the cash flow, the more the value, the higher the, the, or the lower the risk, the more the value. And that's how any financial asset, a firm, a preferred stock, a bond, a common stock, a real estate investment, a project, they're all valued the same way. It's the same concept in finance over and over and over and over again, which means if you're having still having challenges with time value of money, go back and look at chapter four. If you're still having challenges with the valuation of stocks and bonds, go back and, and review those couple chapters because it's the same concepts over and over and over again. We just change stock to firm or we just change stock to bond or we just change firm to project and it is the same approach. So the objective when you're determining the optimal capital structure is to maximize the firm's value, which means minimize R. Because again, when you're dividing by this number, the smaller this number is, the more valuable that cash flow is. So our job is to minimize R. So how do we do that? Well, the EBIT um, over earnings per share. So earnings before interest and taxes over earnings per share analysis can be used to evaluate the attractiveness of a particular capital structure by examining how different proportions of debt affect an earnings affect the firm's earnings per share. And again, although maximizing earnings per share doesn't maximize value exactly because you can really jack up a lot of debt and drive it and, and redeem shares and have a very skewed capital stack, we can approximate the optimal capital structure using this analysis. And again, we go back to what's the objective? The optimal capital structure maximizes the price of a firm stock and the optimal capital structure always calls for a debt to assets ratio that is lower than one that maximizes the expected earnings per share. So the optimal capital structure always calls for a debt to asset ratio that is lower than the one that maximizes earnings per share. And that's to account for the risk. So let's take a look here. Firm currently has no debt, assets of 400,000. The firm can issue debt to repurchase shares of stock at 10% or at $10 based upon the following schedule. So we have equity of 400,000, no debt, debt to asset ratio is zero, cost of debt is zero, therefore, and we have 40,000 shares outstanding. So as we go down this list and we have less and less equity and more and more debt, there's a debt to asset ratio starts at 
zero and we'll take it up to 60. And again, this is just to do a, an analysis on where this optimizes. And we say the cost of debt starts at zero. And as we begin to add debt, again, this is based upon the risk associated with the debt, probability of repayment, and the risk-free rate. So as the risk premium rises, because you have more and more debt outstanding, you can see the interest rate rises significantly. So you have a pretty significant change in the interest rate here between $160,000 of debt and $200,000 worth of debt. It goes up by you know, one and then one and then two and then four and then five. So once we're getting up here, the market is telling us or the analysis is telling us that the, that the risk profile is getting significantly higher. And here's the number of shares of stock outstanding. So we've been repurchasing them. So here it was 40,000 and down here it's 16,000. And again, that kind of just corresponds to the equity in $10 per share. So let's take a look at assuming the operating expenses such as cost of goods sold, depreciation and so forth aren't affected by the capital structure. The firm is expected to generate earnings before interest and taxes as follows. If it's a boom, which there's a 10% chance, $200,000. If it's a normal, neutral economy, it's going to be 600,000 or 60% chance of that, 120,000. If there's a recession, 30% chance of a recession coming, EBIT's going to be $40,000. So let's take a look at what that means when we look at those three probabilities. So debt to assets at zero, debt equals zero. Equity equals 400,000, interest expense equals zero, and there's 400, there's 400, uh, 40,000 shares of stock at 10%. So in a boom, you've got 200,000 of EBIT, 120,000 and 40,000. Here's your probabilities. We just walked through that on the last slide. If you have no interest expense, therefore your taxable income, your earnings before taxes are 200,000, 120,000, 40,000 because there's no interest expense. Your taxes at 40%, 80,000, which is this times 0 0.4, 48,000, 16,000. So your net income, which is your earnings before taxes minus taxes, is 120,000, 72,000, and 24,000. So earnings per share is net income divided by the number of shares. In this case, there's still 40,000 shares outstanding. So, net, so the earnings per share is $3.80 and dollar 60, or excuse me, and 60 cents. The expected earnings per share, which is just taking this amount times, so this weighting times this amount and adding that together gives us a dollar 56 as the expected earnings per share. If we look at it where debt to assets is 20%, debt is 20%, and so we have $80,000 worth of debt which means we have $320,000 worth of equity. Interest off the prior table is at 6%, so our total interest cost is $4,800. And we now have 32,000 shares of stock outstanding because we used that $80,000 to re retire $80,000 worth, or $80,000 worth of stock, which is 8,000 or 8,000 shares. So our EBIT again, going off that prior table, is 200,000, 120,000, 40,000. We now subtract the interest amount, which is gonna be a flat $4,800. So the earnings before taxes are 195,200, 115,200, and 35,200. When we then run that through and we deduct the taxes, multiply the earnings before taxes by the 40% tax rate, we owe $78,080 in taxes, $46,080 in taxes, $14,080 in taxes. So our net income is $117,120, $69,120, or $21,120. Our earnings per share now goes up a touch, and it goes up a touch at least at, at a couple of these um, expected levels because we have fewer shares outstanding. So 366. 216 and 66 cents versus three dollars 180 and 60. So you can see across the board earnings per share go up under any type of economic probability, and our expected earnings per share goes from a dollar 56 
to a dollar eighty six. So we can do this for each one of these these debt pieces, and we say, okay, what's the expected earnings per share? Well, the expected earnings per share started at dollar fifty six, and then we saw it at you know this particular twenty percent case. It was dollar eighty six. If we do it for everything, we get this this line, which essentially says proportion of debt and expected earnings per share. You can see that it optimizes here at 50% with a standard deviation of 72 cents and a coefficient of variation that continues to rise as the risk rises. So again, we saw that as you saw each one of those elements, you know, when we walked down the, the debt structure and it went, you know, one, one, two, three, four, six, or three, four, five, this demonstrates standard deviation of the cash flows continues to grow because of the risk and the coefficient of variation continues to grow because of the risk. And if we plot that out, we plot that out at here's the expected earnings per share and here's the debt to asset ratio. We can see that 50% 50, 50 was where it optimized based upon this chart here. So we plot that out, and you could also plot that this way with the coefficient of risk going. Your basic business risk was here at zero. So if we go back to the original slide, you can see that here's where it was at at zero. Coefficient of variation at uh, 0.46. That's the standard business risk associated with the variation. And then you start adding additional risk associated with the, the financial leverage. And that's just that baseline 46 cent coefficient of variation or 46 um, percent coefficient of variation. And then plotting out this amount and you subtract one from the other to arrive at the financial risk. So let's take a look at um, some of the financial leverage uh, elements as well. So here's one where we've got fixed operating costs of $600,000 and a variable cost of, of 70%. So essentially in this particular case, we've got a, for each additional sale, we're contributing 30% to fixed operating costs. And so how we finance those fixed operating costs is going to be important. We're in different at $2.12 million worth of sales. Essentially at that point, we're making just as much money if we were 40% debt as if we were 100%, 40% debt, 60% equity, as if we were 100% stock. That flips over at this point. So we've got an advantage if we're using debt because we're selling more, our fixed costs remain the same. And so as a result, we're contributing more and more and more and more to our um, to our profitability at a lower price, we actually would prefer having equity because we're not having to cover the debt cost or the debt cost is lower here. And so there's less and less being able to be from being able to be contributed to the um, fixed operating costs. So this is a demonstration of operating leverage. So you can see kind of how all this starts to how this starts to uh, to tie together, and you've got a you've got a situation where at each level of debt, you've got a a particular cost um, associated with that debt, the required rate of return on the debt, your expected earnings per share, and then the expected beta on the stock, and so now you've got a cost of equity. That essentially is you're looking at this formula, which floated itself down to the bottom of the slide. Um, the cost of equity is the 4% um, risk-free rate plus a 5% market return um, that's noted here, and then times the beta. So that's where at a 0% debt, the cost of equity is 12%. You can see as we roll, um, through here, the cost of equity continues to rise as the risk level rises. And this is driven by the fact that you've got some operating leverage in there as well. The estimated stock price 
is the earnings per share divided by the required rate of return on stock. And so you look at this and you go, okay, here's my earnings per share. Earnings per share continues to rise, expected earnings per share. But my company gets more and more risky, and therefore my cost of equity gets more and more risky if we're using the, an example of here's the return on debt plus um, plus return. And so we say, okay, where does stock price maximize? Well, stock price doesn't maximize at the 50% that we saw weighted average cost of capital being lowest. It actually optimizes at 40% debt, which is where the earnings per share divided by R sub S optimizes. So 16% or $16. And again, our job isn't, is, is to look at the, where do we maximize the stock price? The weighted average cost of capital there is actually lowest. So that's where it's at 10.56%. Here it's all equity. Here it's getting higher because the risk is getting higher associated with the equity as well as the debt. And so your lowest average weighted average cost of capital is at a 40% debt level. And you can model that out here you can see that there's a risk-free rate plus a business risk premium, which is if you were at zero, you're essentially looking at your business risk premium. And then you've got a premium for financial risk, which continues to which continues to increase as you add additional debt onto the books, starting at zero and moving up to 60%. So the relationship between capital and capital structure and cost of capital, your cost of equity will continue to rise as you add debt generally. However, you're going to have less equity in the business. So the cost, the cost of equity goes up, but your leverage goes up. So more profit goes to the equity than it does to the debt because the amount that you're paying here is fixed. The weighted average cost of debt also continues to go up as as the uh, as the amount of debt goes up. That's normal. However, what you see is the weighted average cost of capital has an inflection point, and that's because the required return here, while it's going up, the amount of equity is going down, and the amount of debt goes up, but the amount that's paid there is fixed. And so as you go through and do the analysis, you'll find a minimum weighted average cost of capital at 10.6 occurs at 40%. And you can plot, this is essentially just plotting out this chart where you've got your weighted average cost of debt, your weighted average cost of capital, and your cost of equity. All we're doing is plotting this, this, and this out on the chart, and it looks like this, and it becomes obvious where your weighted average cost of capital is lowest. <clears throat> Similarly, when you plot out the stock price against debt to assets, you see a 40% debt to asset ratio, the stock price is highest, and that's just plotting that out and holding the, um, holding the other elements constant. Your degree of operating leverage is the percentage of change in uh, operating income associated with a given change in percent sales. And so as sales go up or down, you've got operating leverage, which essentially is how much is your change in net operating income going up or down based upon a, cha a percent change in sales going up or down. So that's your change in EBIT over EBIT over your change in sales divided by sales. Degree of operating leverage is an indication of your business risk. So again, when you take a look at the sales in this particular case, the expected outcome sales of 250,000 variable costs of 60%, gross profit of 100,000, which is this minus this. You got fixed costs of 75,000, so net operating income EBIT equals 25%. If sales go down or 25, $25,000, Sales go down by 5%, what's our operating leverage? So we take a look at that and we go, okay, if sales go down by 5%, goes from 237.5, our variable costs go down the same percentage. So now our gross profit is 95,000. 95, our fixed costs remain at 
thousand, so our net operating income is twenty thousand. Again, our gross profit minus fixed costs. This went down by five percent. Sales went down by five percent. Variable costs went down by five percent. Gross profit goes down by five percent because this is variable. Fixed costs don't change. So net operating income goes down by 20%, which means our degree of operating leverage, gross profit over EBIT, 100,000 over 25,000 equals 4X. 20% decrease in gross profit for a 5% decrease in variable profit. 20% decrease in gross profit for a 5% decrease in sales. The degree of financial leverage is the percent change in earnings available to common stockholders with a given percentage change in EBIT. So now we're kind of taking that amount, again, no preferred stock, we're taking that amount and we're going to analyze what happens when we have a change in EBIT. So the degree of financial leverage is a change in earnings per share over the change in EBIT. And EBIT is equal to EBIT minus I minus interest. Degree of financial leverage, let's take a look at the same example where a sales went down by 5%. So in this particular case, sales go down by 5%, EBIT went down by 20%, right? We saw that on the last set of slides. If the interest amount is fixed to $12,500, and again, this is set up for Excel. So you, know, you can do the same thing in Excel and it's really easy. You essentially have your interest of $12,500, so your, your earnings before taxes are $12,500 here, $25,000 minus the interest, $20,000 minus the interest, $7,500 here. So earnings before taxes go down by 40% when sales go down by 5% and when EBIT goes down by 20%. So taxes at 40%. 40% of this is 5,000, 40% of this is 3,000, but that stays steady and net income, $7,500 net income in this case, $4,500 net income in this case, down by 40%. So EBIT over EBIT minus I is your degree of financial leverage, $25,000 um, expected outcome here for EBIT. And then you say EBIT minus I, so it was 25,000 minus 12,500, 25,000 minus 12,500 equals 2X. And that's, again, 40% over 20% is 2X. So you can see that this is the, this is a result degree of financial leverage associated with this, with this company. So if we want to look at the degree of total leverage, that's going to be the percent change in sales over the percent change in earnings per share. It's a de degree of operating leverage times a degree of financial leverage. And you can see that there's a relatively complex formula we're going to start getting into called the DuPont analysis or DuPont equation. And it essentially breaks us down. And we're starting to build to that now. So you can see gross profit over EBIT times EBIT over EBIT over I. These two cancel. So your gross profit over EBIT minus I, which will essentially get you the indication of combined risk. In this particular case, we know that it's eight, right? How do we know that? Well, here was the example. Sales went down by 5%. Variable costs went down by 5%. Gross profit went down by 5%. Fixed costs stayed the same. So our net operating income EBIT, EBIT, 25,000, 20,000. So that's... 20. That went down by 4x. Interest, 12,500, 12,500. No change. Earnings before taxes. This went down by 40% from 12,500 to 7,500. Taxes at 40%, that income at 40%. So for a 5% decrease in sales, you had a 40% decrease in net income which is eight times, which is four times and two times, which are the, the degree of operating leverage and degree of total leverage. So in this particular case, we'll walk through it. We saw, we calculated each one of these separately, four and two to eight. You see it there, $100,000 worth of gross profit. EBIT minus I, 25 
1,200 minus 12,500, so 2,500 minus 12,500 gives you 12,500. Divide that into it and you get 8x. So it's difficult to determine exactly how PE ratios and equity capitalization rates are impacted by different degrees of financial leverage. That's going to be driven by a number of market factors, including things like um, supply and demand for the stock. Managers might be more or less conservative than the average stockholder and might set different target capital structures than the optimal one. Um, and so they might be aggressive and kind of be pushing for that high EPS. Um, these are guidelines. So it's, again, you're utilizing it to optimize uh, share price, but managers might not necessarily use some of the same risk assumptions. And managers should not use leverage to the point where the firm's long-term viability is endangered. You can see the earnings per share goes up as you add leverage. Sometimes uh, shareholder or managers are incented by things like earnings per share as opposed to stock price. Um, so they'll take risk in order to drive our earnings per share up um, because they don't have that much. They have a high reward on their bonus, perhaps, but they don't have a high loss associated with the stock price if it goes down, um, which is why you tend to see stock options used, which gives management aligned to stockholders the incentive to drive stock price up. For liquidity and capital structure, there's financial strength indicators, um, times interest earned ratio. That's a ratio that measures the firm's ability to meet its annual interest obligations. It's calculated by dividing earnings before interest and taxes by interest charges. So that's a liquidity ratio. Um, there's a couple, there's a couple uh, capital structure theories that we'll talk about here briefly. Um, tax benefit, uh, bankruptcy trade-off theory, and a signaling theory. So let's hit each one of those. A trade-off theory, um, interest is tax deductible, therefore using debt is less expensive than using stock to finance a firm. Uh, on the other hand, interest rates rise as debt uh, to asset ratio increases because the probability of bankruptcy increases. So as you add more debt, your probability of bankruptcy goes up. Therefore, interest rates um, or required rate of return on debt goes up. Um, but debt is less expensive. So to a point, and we saw this with the example, the value of a firm increases as it uses more debt because you're substituting debt for equity and debt has a lower rate of return required. Um, but the optimal debt level occurs when the tax savings of additional debt are just offset, basically at an indifference point, by the increasing costs associated with a greater chance of bankruptcy. And there's a lot of empirical evidence and there's a lot of studies that show that this is generally the case. This is how investors tend to think of it or how the market tends to think of um, debt to equity ratios. But it's very difficult to figure out exactly what that, that optimal debt level is um, until after you've kind of looked at it in the, in the history or in the past. The signaling theory um, is where many large firms um, use a lot less debt than the trade-off theory suggests or that an optimization theory suggests, um, which is, and there's a question as to why are they doing that? Why are they not optimizing their debt? Um, and it's the signal is an action taken by the firm's management that provides clues to how uh, management views the firm's prospects. And that's given by kind of this concept of market efficiency or, or the, the, efficient market hypothesis, which we talked about earlier. So symmetric information, investors and managers have similar or essentially similar information about a firm's prospects and asymmetric information, which is managers have better information about their firm's prospects than do outside investors. Generally, um, there's a strong argument to be made that there's asymmetric information and not all publicly publicly available, all publicly inf uh, available information is out in the market but not necessarily all non-public information is out in the market price, um, but managers have it. So sometimes utilizing under, under utilizing debt has reserve bar, creates reserve borrowing capacity. You could essentially get more debt at any time. And that's driven by the ability to borrow money at a reasonable cost when good investment opportunities arise. And Firms use less debt than optimal to ensure they can obtain debt later if needed. So they don't optimize for that point in time because they're signaling that they think there's going to be other opportunities to invest that are going to be very attractive. 
there's a lot of wide variation in the use of capital uh, leverage among industries and firms within an industry. Balance sheets tend to be all over the place. Um, some some industries are more higher are more highly leveraged than others. However, you're going to see a wide variation even within industries as to how much leverage companies are willing or able to use. And that's you know, those two theories we just discussed, um, signaling and the, the bankruptcy trade-off theory, are explanations as to why companies don't optimize. And firms with stable earnings generally use um, higher proportion of debt than firms with less stable sales. So if you have monthly recurring revenue, if you have subscription model, if you have something where you know you know what that sale is going to be and it's and it's very stable, you'll tend to see higher use of debt because your cash flow is less volatile than a company that might be in retail or might be driven by the weather or might be driven by other things where you're going to see uh, pluses and minuses associated with sales that could be more volatile and cash flow less predictable. As U.S. firms um, become more worldwide and we continue to see internationalization of business, um, we need to understand that different countries have different capital structures because they have different tax, um, tax schemes that you know, kind of will promote or detract from various capital structures, whether that's common stock, preferred stock, payment of dividends, um, or use of bonds and debt. And so you need to be aware that as you go international, the concepts around, you know, dividends not being tax deductible or interest being tax deductible may change. And that will impact capital structures that you see in other countries and other companies that have international operations. So just be aware of that as you're moving forward. And if you're looking at an international uh, location or you're looking at uh, an international organization, that capital structure decision might be a little bit different.